my, my research on the impact of aid in the acculturation of Latin American immigrants to the U.S. And um, first of all, uh, we're going to see which is the context of this study. Why would we, or I, in this case, uh, want to learn about this phenomenon? Why study immigration and acculturation? What, what's important about that? And the fact is that the United States is, uh, is on the brink of coming to a second surge of immigration as being the main force in terms of um, increase of the population. So today, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, we have 50 million immigrants, and one of them, and one out of seven Americans today is foreign born. So the projected immigration for the future till 2060 is 700, uh, 725,000 immigrants every year. That will put an enormous pressure on the culture as we know it today. And people are rightly scared. And sometimes they say, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to be like the America of the future? So the thing is that each group that comes to the state comes with their own cultural baggage. They have their own traditions. They have their own things, their own habits, their food, their religion, their language. And they all eventually blend in and Americanize. But how do they Americanize? What is the way in which they Americanize? What is what are the variables, what are the factors that make these people more or less successful when it comes to become an American? So the first thing is to analyze immigrant diversity. To the United States can people from all over the world. But if we analyze what are the sources, which are the countries that give the most immigrants to the state, we're going to see that Mexico is by far the largest contributor. 29% of the immigrants, legal or illegal, are from Mexico. Then we have a second big chunk that does not even reach one half of the Mexican uh, influx, and that is China, India, and the Philippines. And then we have El Salvador, Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala. So lots of immigrants are Spanish speakers, or as uh, they are defined by the American Census Bureau, Hispanics. So they combine, Spanish-speaking immigrants combine for 39% of the total immigrant population. And the thing is that actually Hispanics are not a homogeneous population. They're very diverse. So my research question here was, is there a difference when it comes to acculturation between an immigrant who comes to the United States as a younger person and an immigrant who comes here when he is older or she is older and has already a lot of things shaped into him? Already, as one of the researchers in the field said, uh, layers of cultural meaning imposed on him. So I was focusing on the age because I thought, according to Goody Constantine and according to Kramer, who are the big leads in, in acculturation studies, that actually age, with this superimposing of layers of meaning, cultural meaning, would make a big difference when it comes to acculturating. Because the less you have, it's either the less you have to get rid of, or the less you have to accommodate and compromise and blend into the culture of the host society. And my second secondary questions were, OK, what is the role of language? What is the role of the educational level of the immigrant? Uh, what is the role played by social interaction? Are people more prone to acculturate if they interact with the mainstream society? Or are they going to be 
uh, affected by certain events that happen in the interaction. Um, what is the role of the community of origin? We saw that most of the Spanish-speaking immigrants are from Mexico. So are Mexicans more likely to acculturate or are they less likely to acculturate? Because you're going to have a lot of people to refer to that are sharing their own old home values. So those were the questions that I started revising. And my biggest, considering all that, my biggest focus was, OK, if all this plays a part, then age and the younger you are, it's going to be the better. So I plan my, my research on answering that question. Now, why my focus on the Hispanic population? I perform the fact that I am technically Hispanic, as per the definition, uh, because Hispanics are the fastest growing minority in the states. They are also very closely knit as a society. They tend to keep their own traditions. And even into the second and third generation, you do not see many, maybe third generation Hispanic girls who do not have a quinceañera party. Because it's, oh, you have to have that. And it's not part of the of the American, they also have the Sweet 16, because if it's a thing of parties, you're going to have Hispanic celebrating. <laughs> so we have 20 plus countries of origin. We are all different. Uh, we are racially and culturally diverse. You have a Spanish speaker from El Salvador and a Spanish speaker from Chile, and they are probably going to ask what did you mean by that? A lot. Because we have different dialects, I would say, even if we all speak Spanish. And then, this is very important, we tend to show a tendency to maintain the home culture and traditions. It's something we cannot get rid of, apparently. So, these are the key terms. And in, I, I thought it was important to put them here, because there's so much politically charged uh, content when we say Hispanic. And people have an idea of uh, something like Speedy Gonzalez, probably. So it's not necessarily that Hispanic, as defined by the US Census Bureau, which is the one that checks all the statistics, is a person of Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, South, or Central American, or other Spanish culture of origin. That includes a country in Africa. So you can have a completely African-born person who is technically Hispanic, uh, regardless of race. And that creates a very like, gray territory where people are not comfortable. Neither the non-Hispanics nor the Hispanics. So that was one of the things I took very seriously in my research, and I decided not to use the word Hispanic, but Latin American born, because I thought, and this is a very important point for me, that the culture of a Hispanic person born in Africa was not going to be comparable to the already heterogeneous culture of the Hispanics born in Latin America. So at least we were like, shaping the territory under study. And then within this huge population, there are still differences. So uh, what was the aim of my research? My aim was to describe as fully as possible the phenomenon of immigration from uh, Latin America to the US and the transition. We all worry about what we suffer. I think. So how the cultural transition process uh, is affected by age and by other variables. And then my focus was the actual experience. I was, when I did all the literature review, I saw so many papers and works and authors focusing on the, the really hard data and you have charts and tests. And, but there are people behind those numbers. 
and I wanted to see the real data, the, the experience. And I, I think that, and that's my perspective here, the best option to get the real story, the real, the real experiences, was to have a phenomenological approach. And it was, in, in personal terms, it was a really, really rewarding experience, and a very interesting one. So, my research activity was, first of all, define the population and the sample. So, I already mentioned it. My first definition was, okay, Hispanics from Spain, Europe, out. Hispanics from Africa, out. So, we'll keep Latin America. That's big enough. Then I had to identify the possible subjects. And my limit was not only Latin American born, but people who have lived in the States for five years at least. Why was the limit of five years and not just someone who's new to the country? Because in the literature, they, the, the authors make a really strong difference between people who are considered migrants, who are as a transition, like in between, they have not decided to settle, and those who are immigrants. Immigrants are the, those who do reside on a like permanent basis in the United States or in other countries, but in this case, in the United States. Um, once I identified possible subjects, which wasn't that difficult, I had to um, screen them to make sure that they actually were uh, suitable for this uh, research. And then I had to group the subjects according to age at the time of immigration. So according to again, the American Census Bureau, um, an immigrant who comes to the United States when he has not or she has not turned uh, 16 is not, even if it's illegal, it's not considered responsible. So you're a child. If you are 16 or older, you are an adult. You are making your own decisions. So I group them according to, have you uh, if, if your immigration started before or after you turned 16. So I had those two groups. And then I um, had my interviews. And it was so interesting because people actually share their experiences. And it's uh, one of the things that happened to me is that after conducting the interview, and um, and I transcribed and organized my field notes. I transcribed the interview and had everything recorded. And one of the things you are expected to do to make this a formal um, research was validate with the person I interviewed that what I had transcribed was accurate and correct. So I contacted this person and he read it and he felt so bad about it. He said, this is perfectly accurate, but I don't want to see me in this light. So uh, would you please remove my narrative? And of course, since we have an informed consent, and one of, our, one of the key things in the research is that, OK, I'm going to respect your privacy and your wishes. And your, I said, fine. but. I wasn't very, I mean, I had to rebalance more things. And, and this person, I said, okay, I'm going to destroy all the, the notes I have and the recording. And because the recording was going to be destroyed anyway. And he said, okay, you can destroy everything, but can I keep these, these notes? I said, sure. Because I need to see me as I actually saw myself all this time and never realized was my experience. So it was, it was very emotional. In, in, in general, people cannot be like telling a story as if it were something they watch on the news. And some of these stories were very, very moving. And, and I think I'm a better person just by having been exposed to that. People are awesome and they are very resilient. Um, so, I organized
sense of field notes and I identified the clusters of meaning and then I did all the explicitation which is basically getting rid of the um, redundant topics that come up and see how frequently the certain themes come up because that's, that has a lot of meaning in itself and then I made a summary of my findings. And uh, it, was a, it was an amazing ride, actually. Then the demographics. My sample size was very small. It was just six. And the age range was between 22 and 55 years old. Uh, I had five uh, females and one male. Females are more open, I think, to sharing personal stuff. And they don't feel so restrained. And the average years in the U.S. was 23. So it was actually people who had had the time to acculturate. And the educational level was very, the range was wide. Because one of my uh, subjects had some school. She put it like that. Just some school. And then I had various subjects who had master's degree. So it was fine. And the origin uh, of my subjects was from Central and South American countries. One interesting thing is that I could not find one Mexican person in this area despite how important the Mexican immigration is in the States. And that is because Mexican immigration is heavily heavily localized. So you can have as many Mexican subjects you want if you go to El Paso or if you go to California. The Southwest and the West is where all the Mexican immigration is located. I'm not saying that there aren't Mexicans here, but it's not the same. And that's one of the things I found out, that the, the different ethnic groups within these big universe of Hispanics are geographically localized. So you have the big Mexican community in the southwest and the west of the US. You have uh, Puerto Ricans in the east, northeast, mostly around New York City, but also in the northeast. And of course, the Cuban community, which are the three biggest Hispanics groups in the states, the Cuban community in Florida around Miami. So if you want to find a Cuban here, I did find one, but he was the one who said, I'm out of this game. Uh, it's hard. Mexicans are hard to find too. Um, Puerto Ricans are more available. I think that because we are not that far. So it's, again, it has been very, very interesting. So my research findings. After having those interviews and, and analyzing them, um, I was surprised by a couple of things. Both groups, the ones who have transitioned from their home culture to the culture in the U.S. as children or young people, and the people who came here as adults, both mentioned the same thing. And I was like, how come? Don't do this to me. Yes, they did. So the thing they mentioned the most was being prepared. And being prepared does not only mean like, okay, I cross all the, check all the boxes, I have all the logistics figured out, I'm coming here. I have one of my, my subjects actually had a company paid for all the transition, the international movement, uh, she got the car, she got the apartment, she got everything. But anyway, you have to be emotionally ready to be here and to be exposed to things that are not your things. And people mention the smells. The United States smells weird. Oh, and probably a different Hispanic person would agree on the different smell that the normal standard smell would have been a completely different thing. So people coincide in the same 
and they go once and again and again on the same topic. So preparedness was one. The second biggest, biggest and by far most, most, most mentioned thing was language skills. If you are here, you need to speak English. Even if you are living in a very uh, Hispanically oriented community, you need to speak English. And not just to be able to communicate. You need good English. They say, oh, good English is crucial because just English is not enough. And one of the things one of my, my subjects mentioned was like, she said, okay, they tell you this is America, speak English. And when you do, they say, oh, you're a filthy Latino with a bad accent. And that breaks your heart because those are people who are trying so hard. And then they, they face this rejection and they say, okay, I give up. I'm not trying again. So then I, the other thing that they mentioned was discrimination. And discrimination was very much based on language and on physical appearance. The language proficiency was something that would like, cause the first impact. Even if you're on the phone, even if you're talking to someone who cannot see you, they hear your accent and you're treated in a different way. And one of my, my subjects, this, the same person who talked about being treated as filthy, uh, said, I called once to a person who was renting a basement, and when she, and I, I, I lived here close or something, she knew that the, the, the basement was available, and when that person heard her accent, said that the, the, the basement was already rented. Just because of, she was not in contact with the person, not seen, there was nothing like a background check that might have hurt her, nothing, just the accent. Uh, and then the fact that discrimination is so heavy on their perception of themselves makes them go back into the safety of their home culture. So one of the things that we found in this uh, is the importance of the community involvement and the social interaction. Because if you interact with the social mainstream culture, you are more likely to acculturate. You are more likely to achieve those skills and those capabilities that make you a more successful immigrant. But if you find that every time you reach out, there's a, you're hitting the wall, then people are going to stop reaching out. And they're going to be surrounding themselves with the same cultural environment. Like, the ecology is a different one. They don't want to reach out. Some, some of these social interactions are considered risk-free. Everyone says, and that's a very interesting thing, everyone is very religious. And they say, okay, I go to church. Going to church, participating on religious activities, things organized by their church, is that something that they all value very, very highly. And they say, we go to church, and people who are not Hispanics and go to church, they have a different attitude. They are open, they are receptive. So we can grow in our Americanization, in our acculturation in that environment. But other areas are not that immigrant friendly. And one of the things that surprised me most was the school. School is not seen as an immigrant friendly space. Uh, people mentioned, especially the ones who came to the States as younger, uh, immigrants, they mentioned how hard it was for them to become part of the student body. Not because teachers made a conscious effort of making them feel uncomfortable, but because it was hard. They said, you don't know the, the, the way people act. You don't know what is expected. You don't know what, how to be socially successful. And you bring your own stuff, and it does not work. So 
And I always thought, we worry, at schools we worry about bullying, we worry about this, we worry, but we do not see the struggles these children are going through. So there was like books, and I opened it for me. Um, then community involvement, those Hispanics that are successful already want to help the ones who are not. And that's a very nice thing. So oops. education is the most important thing for them. That's a way to overcome your disadvantages. And unfortunately, but now I feel better, my research hypothesis was not supported by data. Age is important in the way that you are more likely to acquire language. But age by itself, as a variable, is not that relevant. They don't even mention it. Uh, preparedness, yes. Language skills, yes. Ways of facing discrimination, yes. But age, no. So why does this matter? Because we need to understand the phenomena. We need to design and plan actions to at least ease this transition, transition, and we need to do that fast because the phenomenon is already here. So uh, that's it. That's my 